So what are permanent disability benefits and how do they differ from temporary wage benefits? Okay, so you have temporary injuries and they become permanent injuries. So temporary benefits are the same regardless of what type of injury you have, whether you have a broken foot, a sprained ankle, um, a torn rotator cuff, a bad neck, a bad back, a head injury. No matter what your injury is, a temporary benefit is always going to be the same. Temporary benefits are monetary awards, it's money that's paid to you to replace your lost wages while you're out of work or if you're working at a reduced capacity, if you're earning less money. Once you return to work and you're earning the same money or more than you were earning prior to your accident, then your temporary benefits will stop. There we go. I wanted people to make sure you could see my, my lovely new pink tie today. Um, so temporary benefits, they're payable based upon your, your degree of disability, your level of, of of temporary disability and your lost time. You need to be out of work on a temporary basis in order to receive those benefits. Once your injuries become permanent, okay, and we're gonna use a term at various points throughout today's discussion called MMI. MMI means maximum medical improvement. And that is when basically your doctors or the doctors in your case, could be the insurance company doctors, uh, determine that medical care is not gonna make you any better. You've plateaued, you've reached that point, well, you're not going to get any better. There's nothing else out there that's going to treat you medically and improve your condition. You've gotten as good as you're going to get. And if you have any remaining problems, your injuries now are permanent. Permanent benefits are payable when your injuries are deemed to be permanent. With permanent disability awards, the most important thing you have to do first is distinguish your injuries because the way different injuries are paid out is very different from one injury to the next. Okay. And there's basically two categories of injuries that you need to focus on here. And they're known as schedulable injuries and non-schedulable injuries. And the easiest way to think about it is a schedulable injury is an extremity, arms, hands, legs, feet, fingers, and toes. Uh, this is the schedule. This is my original schedule that I made in 1997, which I use to this day because it's still the law. This is the schedule. This is the chart of what each of those body parts is worth. Uh, it also includes things like hearing, uh, but essentially, for all intents and purposes, it is uh, extremities, arms, legs, hands, feet, fingers, and toes, okay? That's category number one, schedulable injuries. Category number two are non-schedulable injuries. Um, these are systemic injuries. These are core body injuries, I call it, head, neck, and back. This can include stroke, heart attack, things like that. Um, oftentimes, if you have a... a, a a wide variety of different injuries, you could be lumped into that category, that second category of having non schedulable injuries. Um, if your overall, uh, if all the injuries as a whole disable you as a person, you're probably going to fall into that second category of non schedulable injuries. Um, otherwise, in cases where there is an overlap, if you have a, if, if you had an accident, if you fell down a flight of stairs and you broke your arm and you herniated a disc in your back, if you have overlapping injuries, uh, the path that we go when it comes time to figure out permanent disability, we go down the path um, that's best suited for your circumstances. So if there's very little lost time and you fracture the arm, we're going to pursue a schedule because it's probably worth more money in your case. Whereas on the other hand, um, if you if you you sprained your shoulder but you have a herniated disc in your back that's keeping you out of work um, for a long, long time, we might pursue the non-schedulable route, try to get you more money that way. So it really depends on which of the injuries are the most severe, and um, that's how generally how, how those types of uh, permanent disabilities are divided. Those are the two main categories, schedulable and non-schedulable, okay? Excuse me. Moving along here. And again, if, if anything gets confusing here, please feel free to chime in with any questions. I, I've been doing this a long time, and sometimes I get ahead of myself, so I'm certainly here to help and make it uh, a little more digestible and easy for you folks to understand. Who qualifies for permanent disability payments? And how do you know if you qualify? When do you find out? So anybody who has a permanent disability as a result of a work-related accident could and should qualify for some sort of permanent disability award. Now, there are some circumstances where you don't get money. Um, for instance, and this is a very big one, uh, neck and back injuries, the non-schedulable injuries. You could have hurt your neck or your back. 
You could have been out of work for a few weeks, a few months, but you eventually go back to work. And even though you might have a permanent injury that requires future medical care, um, whether it's therapy or ongoing maintenance care or even medication, if you're back at work and you're earning the same or more money than you were earning prior to your accident, your pre-accident salary, most likely you're not going to get any money because you have no compensable lost time. You don't have a loss of wage earning capacity. Uh, with, with the core body injuries that we discussed earlier, the non-schedulable injuries, um, the, the, the judge is going to look to what's known as loss of wage earning capacity. How much has your injury diminished your ability to find gainful employment? And we could guess at that while you're out of work, and we could look at the evidence and look at the medical and talk to you about your vocational background and try to figure out how much your injury has kept you from earning gainful employment. But if you actually do go back to work, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. If you're back and you're earning full salary or more, then your injury didn't limit you from earning money because you're back earning money. So um, that's one of the circumstances where, you, where a person might not qualify. Um, but generally speaking, if you have a permanent injury, depending on which category you fall in that we discussed earlier, um, it, we start discussing that when you reach the point of maximum medical improvement. And that might come from your doctor. Your, might doc, your, your doctor might uh, evaluate you on a, on a given day, uh, a year or two after your accident date, uh, and reach that conclusion. Or the insurance company might send you to see their doctor, and their doctor might come to the conclusion that you've reached maximum medical improvement. Generally speaking, it's, it's no earlier than one year following the accident, and could be up to two, three, four years following the accident. But it's usually between the one and two year mark that MMI starts popping up in a case. Um, again, if your injuries are relatively minor, if it's a sprained pinky, you know, you might, your doctors might find maximum medical improvement before the one year mark. And if you have a horrible, severe injury that's, you know, requires multiple surgeries, you're going to go well past the two year mark. But generally speaking, um, you're looking at that one to two year mark is when people start uh, having assessments done for maximum medical improvement. And that's when we start discussing things like permanent disability benefits. Moving right along here, folks. Um, how are permanent disability benefits calculated? And are they calculated the same way for all types of injuries? What if you have multiple injuries? So we're going to go back to what we discussed before with the schedulable injuries and the non-schedulable injuries. A schedule a schedulable injury, we, we look for what are known as schedule loss of use awards. And again, this is the schedule. And this schedule identifies the value of each of those body parts listed here. And it's tough to see here, but um, on this chart, you have arm, leg, hand, foot, uh, all the different fingers and toes. And each body part has been assigned essentially a value. Uh, an arm, a total loss of use, 100% loss of use of an arm would entitle you to 312 weeks of workers' compensation benefits payable at the maximum rate. A foot, on the other hand, that's no pun intended. A foot is worth uh, 205 weeks for a 100% loss of use of a foot. And the benefits are, are calculated as a percentage of that total. So if, uh, if it turns out you have a 10% loss of use of an arm, you get 31.2 weeks of workers' compensation benefits. If you have 10% uh, of a foot, you get 20.5 weeks of workers' compensation benefits. Those benefits are payable at the maximum rate. And the maximum rate of compensation differs from case to case, but it is two thirds of your gross average weekly wage at the time of your accident. So it's your earnings right when you got hurt, your gross weekly earnings at the time of your accident. And that is subject to a statutory maximum. What does that mean? Under the law, every year this number changes, but there is a cap, there is a maximum weekly benefit. So uh, I always tell people if Bill Gates gets hurt in New York State, his clearly his average weekly wage would be super duper high but he would cap out at that maximum rate which is uh as of last year it was 1125 it fluctuates every year it's it's uh it's the state average wage so that is how a schedule loss of use award works you're paid based upon the percentage of permanent disability to that injury shoulder arm foot leg once you reach that point of maximum medical improvement, the doctors assess that body part. They do a specific test, it's range of motion primarily, and they figure out what percentage of permanent disability you have to that body part. And that's worth a number of weeks of benefits. 
Now, one thing you need to keep in mind here is the insurance company does have the opportunity to take credit for any prior payments. So what does that mean? If you're 50%, I'm sorry, if you're 10% loss of use of your arm is worth $50,000 and they paid you $20,000 of temporary benefits while you were out of work following your accident, well, then you're going to get $30,000 at the end of your case. They get credit for what they've paid you already. And that's only money that they've paid you. It's not medical. So the money they paid your doctor, they don't take credit for that. It's only money that they've paid you. That's generally how a schedule loss of use award works. Uh, I see some questions flowing in here, but we're going to jump on those in one second. The other category, the non-schedule loss of use category, um, in our industry, we refer, we refer to those as PPD, permanent partial disability. Those are the head, neck, and back cases. Um, the way those cases are compensated for permanent injury. Number one, you need to be out of work or you need to be working at reduced salary uh, in order to get any money at all. So like we discussed earlier, if you're earning the same or more, you don't get benefits. But if you're out of work completely or you're earning less money because of your injuries, that's when the awards kick in. And what happens in those cases? Well, just like the schedule loss of use award where the doctor assesses your injury for how much permanent damage there is, they do the same thing for a neck or a back or a head injury or any of the systemic injuries. And the doctor will provide a medical report with their opinion as to how much permanent disability you have. And generally speaking, the insurance company doctor will do the same thing. The judge will take testimony from both doctors, will do medical depositions. The judge will hear the testimony of the doctors and the judge will make a decision as to how much physical disability you have, how much impairment you have as a result of the accident and as a result of the injuries. But there's a second component to a permanent partial disability award that doesn't exist with the schedule loss of use awards. And that is a consideration of your vocational background. So the judge wants to look at how much impairment you have as a result of the accident and the injuries directly, but then the judge also gets to consider your vocational background to determine whether or not your particular vocational background makes it easier or harder to find a job in the future. And that is a determination of your loss of wage earning capacity. Okay, so what does all that mean? Um, I always give the, the example, you have two people who have the exact same injury. And the first, they both have uh, herniated discs in their back as a result of a motor vehicle accident. The first person um, speaks seven different languages. He, uh, he has, he's a computer technician. He's Harvard educated. He's got all sorts of training. He was in the military. Uh, you name it, this guy can do it. That person, even though both individuals might have the exact same injury and the exact same disability, maybe they both have a 75% disability as a result of their accident, that person, because of the, their vocational background, might find it easier to find a job in the future. So that 75% disability might be brought down to a 50% or a 35% disability because of their vocational background. Whereas person number two, uh, has no formal education, never went to school, um, can't read and write, and the only job he's ever known is sweeping the floor. Well, that individual uh, might have a much more difficult time finding a job in the future with that injury. So uh, that vocational background might bring his loss of wage earning capacity up, and that 75% or 50% disability might be an 80 or a 90, depending on, on what the judge decides. So we do get to factor in your vocational background in, in reaching conclusions regarding your permanent partial disability, the category two, the non-schedulable injuries. Okay. Um, let's see, got some questions popping up. Let me see if I can slide them in here. Uh, sorry, folks, one moment. I, uh... So we have a question here. Two and a half years, I had an accident and they left me with a concussion, shoulder pain that I barely had surgery on. I'm going to question, I don't know what barely having surgery is, but uh, an SI joint pain, sacroiliac joint pain, uh, low back pain for a year. And I have not been paid. Is it difficult to qualify for TPD? TPD being temporary partial disability. Well, uh, again, I'm assuming this is a New York case. I'm going to answer your, your question from a New York perspective because that's all I know, folks. Um, if you've been out of work for two and a half years, so I'm not clear, I'm not 
clear if you've been out of work by this question. If you have not worked in the two and a half years since your accident, you should be trying to get temporary partial disability benefits, especially if you've had surgery. Um, generally speaking, when it comes to temporary partial disability benefits that we discussed earlier, they're payable for your lost time. When you immediately have an accident, you're deemed to be temporarily totally disabled. Um, and you should be getting your maximum rate of compensation. If you have surgery, you are deemed temporarily totally disabled and you should be getting your maximum rate of compensation. So you should, you should be trying to get benefits there. Um, and also another interesting point that you make here is you had a concussion um, and shoulder surgery. So like we discussed earlier, we have schedule awards, the shoulder, and we have the concussion, which is a non-schedule. So you have an overlap, you have, you have injuries in both categories. So it's like we discussed earlier, I see you just uh, popped in a comment here, not work. Well, that, that's a whole different uh, can of worms altogether. If it's not work, I, uh, it really depends. There's a lot of other factors there. You're probably looking at a personal injury matter and you should speak with your personal injury attorney. If you have any questions about that, give me a call. We can go over it um, and figure out what your different um, legal opportunities are here. Uh, but if you're at the two and a half year mark also for a personal injury case, you really need to get moving on it because there's a statute of limitations issue there as well. So please uh, make sure you, you do what you have to do. Uh, that person is saying it was a truck accident. Uh, if you have a lawyer, you better get on the phone with your lawyer. If you don't, give me a call. I'll see what I can do to help you out. Okie dokie. Moving on. Excuse me. How do you get your permanent disability benefits? Does it work the same way as temporary wage benefits? Um, no, it's very, uh, very different. So temporary wage, temporary disability benefits are paid while you're out of work. All workers' compensation awards that are paid for lost time are paid their weekly awards. So a judge might award you $600 a week, $500 a week, whatever it might be. But generally they're weekly awards, but they're paid to you bi-weekly. The insurance companies save a few pennies every time by sending you out, sending checks out every two weeks instead of every week. Um, that's how generally temporary wage benefits are, are paid. In certain circumstances where there is a, a, an award has been suspended, if a case has been fought, if, if the insurance company says that we don't believe that this is a, a, a compensable case uh, and we litigate that and we win, then you get retroactive awards for your temporary benefits. You'll get that in one lump sum. But as benefits uh, proceed into the future, they're generally paid every two weeks. Um, but retroactive awards, money that they owe you, they pay you in one lump sum to bring you up to date. Similarly, going back to the two categories again, schedule loss of use awards are generally paid as one lump sum. 99.9% .9 of the time they're paid in one lump sum. There are certain circumstances which require boring explanation where they might not be payable as one lump sum, but even in those circumstances where they might not be payable in one lump sum, you can generally ask the judge to make the award uh, as one lump sum. And I, I, I've not had a denial of that request thus far. So like I said, your uh, schedule loss of use award is payable at one, as one lump sum. Permanent partial disability awards, and that's the non-schedule, generally are paid out over time and they're biweekly checks, very similar to temporary wage benefits. So um, like we discussed earlier, that that back case uh, where the judge has determined that a person has a a, uh, a permanent partial disability and has evaluated their permanent disability and their loss of wage earning capacity and their their vocational background and they reach a conclusion. Um, each level of of determination we we call it the cap, okay? And depending on what the judge classifies you as having in terms of a loss of wage earning capacity. Uh, that tells us how many weeks of benefits you get. So for instance, if you have a 75% disability, you're capped out at 400 weeks of benefits. Uh, that's 7.69 years. A 50% permanent partial disability, a 50% LWEC, loss of wage earning capacity, uh, gets you 300 weeks of benefits. That's about five and three quarters years of ongoing awards. Those awards are payable over time. Um, but what you can sometimes do, and it really depends on the, the, the circumstances of your case, it depends on who your insurance company is, sometimes we can work what's known as a Section 32. And this is going back to some of those other discussions we've had in the past. You could try to take that lump sum. You could try to take that, that, that 
schedule of awards, that 300 weeks that they owe you and work out a settlement and say, hey, give me X amount of dollars. It's usually a, a percentage portion of that overall amount that they owe you, but say, hey, give me X amount of dollars right now and everyone goes away happy and we're done. So even though a, a, a non-schedulable award are, are paid out over time, a lot of times you can work out a settlement of those types of awards as well and close your case out. Mr. Trav, the trucker, I see you, you, you threw a question here. Uh, I received an enclosure discovery worksheet from defendant, already had sh surgery on shoulder, just had an MRI positive for herniated disc, neck and back. Sorry to hear that you're going through a lot. I don't know what an enclosure uh, discovery worksheet from the defendant is. This sounds like something that's not New York uh, based, unless this is from your uh, your third party case. Does this have to do with your lawsuit? Were you, uh, were you, are you suing somebody that hit you? Um, this might pertain to that, and you should speak to your third-party uh, liability attorney. It doesn't sound like a workers' compensation thing, um, but positive MRI, herniated discs, neck and back. If you were working at the time, if you were driving your truck and you had a motor vehicle accident, regardless of who is at fault, maybe you were at fault completely, you might still be entitled to workers' compensation benefits, at least if you fall under New York jurisdiction. Um, if you have questions about that, please feel free to reach out. Uh, folks, I know my phone number is uh, trailing on the bottom of the screen here on the YouTube, not so much on the Instagram, but we are always here, 212-406-8989. Feel free to give me a call anytime. Uh, happy to help. Are there any mistakes injured workers make when it comes to permanent disability benefits? Any red flags that we should look out for? Um, one of the biggest ones, you know, we've talked about this in the past, um, fraud, and there's a term that, that uh, you might not know the, the meaning, malingering. When you go to see your doctor or when you go to see the insurance company doctor, don't malinger. What does that mean? Don't fake it, okay? Don't tell them, oh, you, my shoulder's killing me. I can't lift it up. This don't do the best you can. Give them the best effort you can give them. Make it real. Um, if your injuries are that bad, they're going to show themselves. If you try faking it, if you try making, your, if you try showing that you're that you're more limited than you really are, it's going to come through. These doctors are very smart people. They didn't become doctors by accident. So, um, go out there. Your your injury will show itself, and give them the best effort you can give them. It really it helps your case because once a doctor marks down that you you might be faking it, you might be malingering, you might not be putting a, your your best effort into the the, the testing. It's going to show itself. It's going to be right in the judge's face, and it's going to make you look bad. Do not, uh, don't, don't do it. Give them the best effort you can. Try as hard as you can when you go for these these exams and these tests, um, and it's really going to help your case. Also, uh, another thing I see people do all the time is, you know, they 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 try to show how, how bad their overall situation is. Like we discussed earlier, there's there's two categories of injuries, and as as a lawyer, I know which path we're going to go down with your particular case based upon your circumstances. And I'll see people on a case where I'm trying to get them a, an award for a shoulder injury where they had surgery and they're sitting there telling the doctor, oh, my back, my back. But if you're back at work and you're earning the same amount of money or more money than you were earning before you got hurt, unfortunately, there's no money in the back. And you know they're trying to, to, to show that the, their case might have more value by showing that they have this really bad back injury, whether they do or they don't, when the real purpose is a shoulder exam so let, let's focus on what we need to do here give your doc your doctors and the insurance doc doctors your best effort and, and and get through it your the severity of your injuries will show themselves and if you if you're trying to malinger it that's going to show itself as well just don't do it it's just not worth it that's probably the biggest uh the biggest mistake that we see as a workers comp lawyer do I have any permanent disability pro tips? Well, um, I mean, the biggest tip I can give you is have a good, knowledgeable doctor, workers compensation doctor. And that's that's important on so many different levels. A good doctor, obviously, is going to give you the treatment that you need to get you as good as they can get you. Um, the purpose here, listen, you got hurt. It was an accident. It, they call it an accident for a reason. We want to get you better. We want to get you back to work. We want to put this behind you. And having a good doctor is going to get you as close to that as possible. Um, the second thing they're going to do is they're going to document your file properly so that your lawyer has all the tools they need to go forward. 
And that kind of brings me to the next point. Having a good attorney is almost is just as important as having a great doctor. Um, because your lawyer is going to know how to present the medical evidence that the doctor gives you in the best light possible. And on top of that, your lawyer is going to have the opportunity, if it comes down to it, to cross-examine the insurance company's doctor. So maybe you did go for an IME and maybe he did write a report that's not so favorable to you. But your lawyer is going to know the law. He's going to know where the value lies in your case. And he's going to know how to extract that. And he's going to know how to cross-examine their doctor and go after him for the things in his report that are hurtful to you in your case. Um, and another great tip, and this is something I tell all my clients all the time, we get calls every day. Uh, I went to an IME and he was rude and he ignored me. And then I got the report and it's missing all the things I told him. And it says I did, uh, he did testing that he never did. When people call me up and they tell me they had a problem with their IME, their independent medical examination, their insurance company, medical examination, I tell all my clients the same thing. Take your report make a photocopy, sit down. Once you're calm, once you have a clear head, sit down with a second copy of that report and take notes, make notes in the margin, circle the things that are wrong, highlight the things that you have a problem with, make notes and send it to me. And if you really need to come make an appointment and sit down with me, let's go over that examination. Because when it comes time for me to cross-examine that doctor, you were in the room. I wasn't. I want to know exactly what happened. I want to know your perspective so I know how to go after this doctor for something he might have done wrong and try to help you with your case. So help your lawyer. Make notes on your IME. Write things down and tell your lawyer about it because it's going to help you help him get you more money. Very, very important. Okay, any other questions here? Well, positive dude. What's up, positive dude? Is chronic pain a disability? It's a very good question. Is chronic pain? Can pain be disabling? You know, it's, it's a question that I use on a lot of depositions, like I was just discussing, uh, of IME doctors, because they'll say the client came in complaining of pain on a level of 7 out of 10. And I'll say, well, and I'll say there was no findings, but he had severe pain. And my question is, is pain disabling? Can pain be disabling? And the doctors always say, well, pain is subjective, and it differs from one person to the next. But generally speaking, the doctors give me the same response, that yes, pain can be disabling. So is chronic pain a disability? It can be. Um, it's nice to have it linked to a specific diagnosis. Could be, um, you know, uh, radiculopathy, herniated disc, um, something like that. But yes, chronic pain can be a disability, can be disabling. Positive dude, I, I hope your chronic pain doesn't uh, impact your positivity. We need more positive dudes out there. And you are very welcome, my friend. Uh, any other questions? We got one right here. Does it matter if the injury is a wrist, but I injured it years ago? Uh, it could matter. It could matter if, if you have a problem with what's known as the statute of limitations. So in New York State, with a workers' compensation case, excuse me, I just need a... There are two time limitations we need to focus on. There's a bunch of them, but there's two important ones. The first one is notice. You have to give notice of your injury within 30 days of your accident. So if you get hurt, you're supposed to give written notice of your accident to your employer within 30 days unless they have actual notice. Actual notice can be your boss saw you fall off the, a ladder. Actual notice can be uh, you called them from the hospital or from the ambulance to tell them what happened. Actual notice can be that they saw it or some or a coworker told them. you got to give notice within 30 days. So if something happened years ago, uh, I just would want to make sure that their the, the employer was properly notified. And the second thing is the statute of limitations for filing a claim. You have two years to file a claim for workers' compensation benefits. If your claim was timely filed, if if a case was filed for you and it was five, six, seven years ago and everything was done by the book and it sat dormant for a few years, yes, you should be able to uh, resuscitate that case and get for a wrist injury like you're describing here, a schedule loss of use award. Uh, a wrist is worth, a, a wrist as a hand is 244 weeks for total 100% loss of use of a wrist. So even a 10% permanent disability to a wrist would get you 24.4 weeks of compensation. Uh, at a modest, let's say you earn $1,200 per week, two thirds of that would be $800. A 10% disability for a wrist is $19,520. So for a person who earns $1,200 per week, gross, and has a 10% injury to a wrist, which is, you know, a bad sprain with some limitations, a 
could be a fracture. Uh, really depends on what your testing shows, but that's $19,500 that you could potentially be leaving on the table if you don't pursue that case. So it's certainly worth looking into. Um, but again, it's subject to a lot of different other factors, your salary uh, and the severity of the injury being the two most important factors there, but it's certainly worth speaking to somebody. And if you want to go over things, I'm, I'm here to talk. Uh, but thank you. Jay Mislabel, very good question. Oh, I see a good one here. What if your job cannot take you back with permanent restrictions? This is something we're seeing more and more of. A lot of bigger employers out there, and I'm not going to name names, uh, we're getting this where people might have a 10% loss of use of their wrist, a relatively minor permanent injury, and their employer tells them, we don't take people back with partial disability, permanent disabilities. Uh, sorry, go find a job elsewhere. Um, you know, it's, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, whether or not it's actionable, it's not necessarily actionable under workers' compensation law. There might be an employment law violation here. There might be some sort of EEOC or something like that. Um, we do have attorneys that we work with that are well-versed in these areas. If you think that you might, uh, they might be stepping on your rights by not taking you back, give us a call. I can put you in touch with somebody who could certainly help you out uh, and give you the, the, the pros and cons there. Uh, it's a fantastic question, uh, Stephen Medina. We do hear about it all the time, and it's really, really fact-specific. We need to sit down with the person and understand uh, what happened with a particular employer and why things are going the way they are. Um, so I, it, it, it's difficult to just give a blanket response there, uh, and it's a horrible thing to hear about when it happens because, you know what, nobody has to get hurt. Nobody wants to get hurt. Everyone wants to go back and go to their job and, and, and do what they got to do and earn a living and support their family. And when you hear that, well, because you got hurt here, uh, and you have, God forbid, a, a permanent injury because of it, regardless of how severe it is, and we're not going to take you back. It's really a crappy feeling, and 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 I feel for you there. Uh, but please, if you want to go over things, please let me know. Freddie O, how do you calculate two different body parts? Example: ankle and both knees. Well, uh, again, go to the chart. This this chart is available online. If you go to the New York State Workers' Compensation Board website, okay, it's uh, nyc. I'm sorry, not nyc, wcb.ny.gov, I believe, is the URL. Um, and right in the middle of the page, if you scroll about halfway down, there's a medical tab, and it says impairment guidelines. If you click in there, that chart's in there. Um, so I recommend you go in there, take a look, and it'll tell you the chart. But just so I'm not spewing incorrect facts a leg so a knee is a leg a knee is 288 weeks for total disability and like i said earlier an ankle is 205 so if you have 10 percent of each a 10 percent of uh what you say is both knees 10 percent of an ankle is 205 uh so it would be 20.5 and 10 percent of each knee would be 28.8 add them up multiply by your compensation rate subtract any prior payments that you've received and that's what you're looking at um that works for any of the injuries on the chart. Add them up, subtract prior payments, and you're done. Uh, if, you, if you want a little more specificity there and you have some of the, uh, the facts, your average weekly wage, uh, give me a call. I'll go over them with you. Okay. I see... Uh, Jay Mislabel, this is the person who asked earlier about the wrist injury from years ago. So she just came back with a little more information. The first was not work-related, but you recently fell at work. So you're, you're talking about now what's known as apportionment. If you fractured your wrist five years ago uh, because you were doing wheelies on your motorcycle and you fell down, and now you go back to work, and six months ago you, uh, you lifted a box and you, and you felt a, a pop in your wrist um, and you re-injured that wrist, when it comes time to determine the schedule loss of use of your wrist injury, your doctor should comment on apportionment. So he might say, okay, Jay, Miss Label, you have a 50% permanent um, loss of use of that wrist right now. Of that 50%, 30% of that is due to your old motorcycle accident and 20% is due to your work accident, whatever it is. So that's apportionment. That's apportioning your overall permanent disability to the different accidents that caused your current permanent status. Good question.
Todd Wagner. I had cervical disc surgery with a bilateral shoulder radiculopathy and rotator cuff surgery. Wow. I'm in physical therapy, been off work for five years. What do you think I should settle for? Well, the biggest factor here is something uh, is a piece of information that I don't have, and that's your average weekly wage. Please don't post it. We don't need people knowing your your personal uh, your personal uh, information. Um, rotator cuff surgery with you know th there's a lot of factors here. Lost time is a big one. Um, okay, and uh, and and your earnings, your prior payments. There's a lot of different factors here. Um, it's also, is this a New York state case? I'm, I'm assuming that it is. Uh, if you have a lot of different factors here, if you have an attorney, I, I would assume that at this juncture, you have a lawyer, uh, I would speak to your lawyer, have a sit down and go over the, you know, the, the different facets of your case and where the value lies. If you don't have a lawyer and you want to discuss it, please feel free. Uh, I'm more than happy to, but there, there's a lot of fact. It, it's hard to give you a number really. All right. What do we got here? Hi, sir. I was involved in an accident last April. Uber driver. Still have an injection. Still working. Got an injection. Still treating with my doctor. I have multiple body parts. What's next? Well, it depends on what those multiple body parts are. If it's a head, neck, and back injury, if those are your multiple body parts, and you're working, and you're working at full duty, or you're, you're earning, you know, in the workers' comp world, we say light duty and full duty, and it means something different than other people. If you earn $1,000 a week, um, as a construction worker, and you go back to work following an injury, and you were in a thousand dollars a week, and all you're doing is sitting there waving the flag. Well, yeah, you're working light duty. You're not able to do your old job. But as long as you're earning the same amount or more, we don't consider that light duty. So that that's that's kind of a uh, an area where we have uh, we have issues with, with, when you compare workers' compensation to the real world. But if you're back at work and your multiple injuries are head, neck, and back, uh, you can get all the treatment that you need but you don't necessarily get benefits, monetary benefits. If your multiple injuries include an extremity, an arm or a leg or a knee or a shoulder or something like that, well, then you might be entitled to a schedule loss award. So uh, again, like the last individual that asked the question, I, there's a little more information I need here in order to give you a more tailored answer, uh, but certainly you're entitled to benefits. Certainly you're entitled to a claim, you're entitled to medical benefits and whether or not uh, you're entitled to monetary awards, that's very possible here. So I would, uh, I would look into that. Ms. Fatima, what do we have here? My neck and back got injured from a work accident. Third party settled. Workers comp fight. Okay, so I, I'm not understanding the question entirely, but your third party settled in your workers' compensation case, you're still battling with the insurance company. Uh, sorry to hear that. Uh, there, there's a you, the case like this has a lot of different facets that need to be investigated. Um, the, the nature of the accident is very important to know. What Was it a car accident? Or was it something else? Um, your third party settled. We need to know how much your third party case settled for because there are, there are implications there as to what the insurance company might be on the hook for moving forward. So um, if you have an attorney, my third party settled. I'm assuming you have attorneys on the comp and the third party. You surely have a discussion with both sides of that. Uh, I see you say your lawyer is appealing so that you, you might have had the neck denied there. Um, I would certainly have a sit down with your attorneys. Um, listen, your lawyers are here to help you. If you don't understand something, um, talk to them. You know, you, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Lawyers are, are in a position where we're more knowledgeable about the law and your case. And it's our job to make sure you understand what's going on with your case. So if you have questions, always call, sit down. With your lawyer shooting me an email I, I i answer emails from my clients all the time about different aspects of their case and things that they're confused about so uh you're certainly within your rights to do that uh, but I, I would recommend that yet that you have that frank discussion with your attorney or both attorneys uh mr wagner you're very welcome <laughs> i wish you the best i wish all everybody here the best uh i know you guys are dealing with a lot and um you know it sucks you're you're hurt most people that get hurt on the job are out of work for a period of time you know, you had a way of life that you were enjoying and you were doing everything you could. And, you know, it, it, you, you hit a point that you didn't ask for and it came out of nowhere. And now you're home, you're hurt, you're in pain. You you, you, you need money to make ends meet. You know, it, it's a real crappy situation to be in. Um, and we're here to do everything we can to help you get through that situation with 
a system that, let's face it, is less than perfect. The workers' compensation system in, in New York is an old, old system, and it gets tweaked and modified and 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 molded and shaped uh, by by the legislature every year in little ways. Uh, but it's it's not a perfect system, and and it's the framework that we have that that to operate and to get you what we could try to get you to to to, to move forward with your life. Um, but you know, we try the best we can, and and and. If there's anything that anybody here can do to help you, please always feel free to reach out. Um, 212-406-8989 is our phone number. Uh, another question, when you're assigned a judge to the final court and his past decisions are biased toward insurance, can I ask for another judge? You cannot. You can't ask for another judge. Um, just because a judge ruled in favor of an insurance company doesn't necessarily mean that that judge is biased. And listen, some judges lean one way more than the, than the other and just the way it is. Um, for the most part, our workers' compensation judges are good judges. You know, they're people that have worked in the industry in the past. They're, they're, they're smart people. They're good people. And they are really doing the best they can to try to get the right decision made. And that decision might not always be something that you think is fair. Uh, and again, that's why you need to speak to your lawyer and get an understanding of where these decisions are coming from. You might not like it. You might not think it's fair. But, you know, people get call and they say, oh, there, there, there's something bad is going on here. And the judges are really, the judges are good people trying to do the best they can uh, within this, like I said, imperfect system. Um, that's why it's important to set yourself up for success and not failure. Uh, get a good doctor, get a good lawyer, listen to them, do what you need to do. And, and don't try to, there's no quick fix. There's no end around. There's no, you know, pro tip that's going to get you all the money in the world. Uh, it is what it is, and you just got to get good people working on your case to get you to that to that goal line. Uh, don't blame the judge. I, I know it's an easy way to do it, and, and sometimes you might not like the judge's decisions. I We get decisions that we don't like also, and I get upset, and it is what it is. I'm not going to say that the judges are, are, are out for blood. The judges are all here trying to do the best they can to do what's right, and that's really what it comes down to. Uh, thank you. For, you're very welcome. I'm very happy to help. See, one more question here. Injured my knee. Divine creations. We're all divine creations. I injured my knee at work six months ago. The insurance company finally approved the surgery six months later. The surgery didn't help. What are my options? You are in Chicago. Well, I don't know Illinois law. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not licensed in Illinois, and I don't know Illinois workers' compensation law. Uh, if that case were here in New York and you needed an additional surgery, if you needed additional PT, physical therapy, um, you know, they do uh, injections for knees that that, that sometimes help. Um, you have various medical options. I would certainly speak to your doctor about what your medical options could be in terms of legal options. I don't know. You'd have to talk to your lawyer about that in Chicago. Um, like I said, I'm not licensed in, in, in Illinois. Um, if you do need help tracking down a lawyer, uh, we do have a network of lawyers out there that we can sometimes help find lawyers out of state. So please, if you need to go over, give me a call, 212-406-8989. And with that, folks, I thank you for your time. I hope I answered your questions. Uh, like I said, this is not the sexy topic of settlements and money that everyone loves talking about so much, uh, but we've been getting a ton of feedback, uh, emails and phone calls every day about permanent disability, how long can I get benefits for, and how does a, a permanent injury for a knee work, and has a permanent injury for a back work, and we get these questions constantly, and uh, I really wanted to just sit down and kind of give you uh, all the information, try to answer those questions for you. It's, uh, it's confusing. It's confusing for people that are not knowledgeable, and no one expects you, a, a, a driver, a warehouse worker, a teacher, a nurse, uh, who's working day to day, who gets hurt out of nowhere to be knowledgeable about uh, the workers' compensation law. So we're here to help with that. And um, please, if anybody has any questions, 212-406-8989. Uh, and I thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day, everybody.